Save a dollar on fresh country style pork ribs, just $3.79 per pound. Whole red ripe seedless watermelons, $12.99 each. Select varieties of Friendly's dessert ice cream cups, only $3.49 for an 8.5 ounce tub. 10 ounce package of stone skillet English muffins, only $5.99 for select varieties. 12 pack refreshing LaCroix sparkling water, only $8.99 for select varieties. Visit our website at www.marketplace.pm for more super specials. You're watching Bermuda Tonight. It's Wednesday, July 10th. I'm Jasmine Patterson, and thanks for joining us. Governor John Rankin has announced that he's decided to grant a posthumous pardon to the Reverend Charles Vinton Monk. Premier David Burke made the pardon request last year in a bid to correct what some saw as an historic wrong. Reverend Monk was locked up in the early 1900s for libel after he wrote about the unfair treatment of Jamaican laborers who were imported to work at the Royal Naval Dockyard. Governor Rankin today stated posthumous pardons are only granted in the most exceptional of cases. After a careful consideration. I am satisfied, however, that in exercising his freedom of expression, the Reverend Monk was seeking to serve in the public interest. The fact that together with the likely truth of what he wrote and the evident procedural irregularities in the trial justify the grant of a pardon in this instance, and end quote. One serious sex offender was not released from prison as scheduled after he failed to complete the required programs in accordance to new legislation. Attorney General Kathy Lynn Simmons told the Senate recently that updated legislation regarding the handling of sex offenders in Bermuda, despite some, quote, teething pains, is proving effective. Sex offenders who do not complete required programs during incarceration are not released at their earliest possible date, nor released on parole. This is a legal requirement contained in the Criminal Code Sex Offender Management Amendment Act 2018. Minister of Legal Affairs Kathy Lynn Simmons says at least one serious sex offender who was due to be released from Westgate two months ago had it deferred until he completes the required program. It's not understood what type of programs specifically need to be completed completed by offenders. The public is given notice when an offender deemed high risk of reoffending is due to be released. Another aspect of the changes to the legislation. This information is only disclosed after a psychological assessment done by the Department of Corrections determines a significant risk of reoffending or harm. The release of Junius Keynes, a convicted sex offender, was met with criticism recently after he successfully argued that wearing an electronic monitoring device as part of his release order would not be suitable due to interference with his medication. Keynes served a term of imprisonment after committing a serious sex offense on a woman and was released on June 24th this year. He is due to attend a court hearing next Wednesday for lawyers to present evidence that an EMD is harmful to his well-being. It's the policy of the Department of Court Services that all moderate or high-risk offenders who sexually offend against children will be fitted with an electronic monitoring device during the period of community supervision. Local charities called for assurance from authorities that canes would be monitored effectively, even without an EMD. Minister Simmons stated that the Department of Court Services conducts random curfew checks, visits their homes and employment sites, makes contact with their significant others to corroborate information, and enrolls the sex offenders in a community-based program inclusive of treatment and referrals for additional services as deemed necessary. The minister confirmed that a sex offender's register has been established and is operational, containing the details of individuals convicted or released from incarceration for a sexual offense against children or adults. Offenders appear on the register for a period of 10 years or more, and it's suspended during times an offender is locked up. We'll have more for you after this short break, including all the latest weather news. Stay with us. If your doctor refers you for a CAT scan, think of Bermuda's leading private CT service, Ground Arrow Clinic, where we pay special attention to privacy, comfort, and parking right outside our door. And our scans are read at the Leahy Hospital, Brown Arrow Clinic, building trust one patient at a time. 297-3333. Now open evenings and weekends.
Every home tells a story. Your story is all yours. Big kid, too cool. I make my own rules. Wherever you live, whatever your style, express yourself. My style says what's up. Don't want to ever grow up. So many styles to help tell your story and create your unique dream home. Start shopping for furniture at U.S. prices today. Lifestyle Furniture is Bermuda's newest furniture store and is proud to be the home of the number one furniture company in the world, Ashley Furniture. Visit lifestylefurniture.bm or stop by our showrooms today. Lifestyle Furniture, this is home. And thanks for staying with us. It is time for the government to bite the bullet and pay overtime to ensure trash is collected twice per week. That's the word from the OBA leader, Craig Cannonier, who believes the island's rodent problem is being made worse by the current once-weekly trash collection. The opposition leader, mindful of the difficulties the government has had in getting waste management employees to collect trash twice a week, believes money should be no object in this case that I believed uh, overtime was brought up and that we have massive amounts of overtime within government. What I did say is that there are sometimes uh, a, a life can throw you a curveball. I believe that in Bermuda right now that the populace, the taxpayer, would pay more and pay overtime to have their trash picked up twice a week. We cannot continue to have headlines of rats upon rats upon rats getting into our trash. Right now, there's not a policy out there that says you can't put out your trash in a plastic bag on the street. And so what's happening is you've got, you know, thousands of these plastic bags out there, the rats and the cats and the dogs, everyone, the birds, everyone is, is taking their pick. Trash is all over the place. Until we have a policy that says you have to put it in a bin, then I think that we should be paying what we need to pay to ensure that health and safety is paramount, not only with those who are working within the sanitation uh, area, but also with our general populace and not having uh, this kind of uh, trash all over the place. The government should bite the bullet on this case. Yes, I think they should bite the bullet in this case, and there are other areas that uh, can net huge amounts of savings outside of the overtime there. And of course, what I'm saying is we do this, but we, again, we have to build in the efficiency there as well uh, while we're doing it. So. Elsewhere, Mr. Cannonier said he supports government efforts to eliminate waste and overspending through its efficiency committee. One area he would like to see improvement on is performance appraisals of government workers, something he said remains lacking in some departments. There are certain departments uh, within government that to this day do not have performance appraisals. That is a big problem. How do you assess efficiency when you're not even uh, having a performance appraisal? So we've got to sit down again with the uh, unions and go back through this here for some of these negotiated agreements and ensure that our performance appraisals are built within every department that we have. This is a challenge, but we've got to sit down and do it. Would the object be in such a case to sort of weed out those uh, civil servants who are not up to the task, performing badly? Yeah, no. Performance appraisals are not for that. Performance appraisals are to point out the strengths and, of course, those weaknesses so that you can improve on them. Well, performance appraisals are not designed so that, you know, you want to get rid of someone. That's not the objective at all. What we want to do is improve on our in, uh, uh, inefficiencies. So a performance appraisal will allow us to identify these areas and what do we now do to fix them. Hollywood heavyweights and former Bermuda residents Catherine Zeta-Jones and Michael Douglas have come out in support of Bermuda's first gay pride parade. The duo who are in the process of selling their sprawling Warwick estate are the latest entrants to a growing list of supporters. A Facebook page supporting the August 31st parade has garnered more than 3,600 followers since launching two weeks ago. Social media has become the recruiting ground for both pro and anti-marriage gay groups. Uh, in some cases, it has led to threatening and violent comments which police say they are now investigating. Elsewhere, the government today signed a landmark charter on the rights of seniors whom the Premier described as a key demographic of the community. The charter enshrines responsibility and rights for seniors, including those in need of elderly care. The move was backed by the Aging Well Committee as well as the seniors' right charity Age Concern. The importance of aging well and ensuring truly golden years for senior citizens is a priority of this government. In our 2017 general election platform, 
the Progressive Labour Party undertook to, and I quote, review the laws to reflect international best practices to enact a charter of rights and responsibilities for seniors, end quote. Our goal is to recognize and respect the rights of people who became more dependent on others due to aging, illness, or disability, <clears throat> and to ensure they lead a lives of dignity and independence. Under the leadership of Mr. Derek Burgess and with the technical input of the Ministry of Health, I am pleased today to deliver on the promise that we made. The Charter is designed to be a reference document setting out the fundamental principles and rights that are needed for the well-being of all those who are dependent on others for support due to age, illness, or disability. Premier David Byrd. Now we go to AccuWeather for the latest weather forecast. AccuWeather is presented by BFNM Insurance Group. We now go to AccuWeather headquarters. This AccuWeather forecast on ZBM is brought to us by the folks at the BFNM Insurance Group. We had some locally heavy showers, but things are improving across Bermuda as we move deeper into time. Uh, there is some activity to talk about elsewhere in the uh, Atlantic, mainly in the Gulf of Mexico, with uh, our uh, tropical depression getting going, potential tropical cyclone number two uh, becoming uh, evolving into a, eventually a tropical storm uh, over the northern part of the Gulf of Mexico. But locally, our issue has been a recent front that has barely creeped across the area, bringing some showers through the area. I say barely because it's not going to fire much farther south, uh, but it's been just enough to take a little bit of a bite out of the humidity uh, as we look ahead to tomorrow's forecast. Right now, the humidity is still somewhat high at 80 to 85 percent. Air temperatures are around 80 degrees, maybe a degree or two cooler than where they were yesterday at this point. Uh, wind is active from the west at 15 to 20 miles per hour, and the water temp is up a degree, up to 84 right now, so it's getting pretty comfortable in the water. Uh, but boating weather is still a little bit hazardous. Around the periphery of Bermuda, we have four to six foot waves. The wave heights will be decreasing deep into the night and tomorrow. But in the meantime, early this evening, the Bermuda Weather Service does hold on to this small craft warning for just a few more hours early this evening. Uh, so uh, the tide is on the way out of here. We have a low tide at 1036 tonight. The tide will come back in early in the morning on Thursday. Another low tide at 1048 a.m. High tide late tomorrow afternoon. Uh, so uh, that is what we are uh, up against here as we look at the schedule. Tonight, lingering showers. There are still a few odd lightning strikes here and there, mainly to the south of the island. It's possible we may have a leftover thunderstorm, but for the most part, lingering showers, patchy clouds, and we say goodbye to the moisture for a day. We're going to go from high humidity to moderate humidity with a mostly sunny, beautiful day tomorrow. Uh, and you can see Futurecast takes most of the green away from Bermuda, off to the south. High pressure will be uh, setting up shop off to our northeast and uh, will be generally rain-free for most of uh, the next three or four days. There Thursday looks dry, Friday probably dry, even into Saturday and Sunday. Any isolated showers will be very short-lived and insignificant. So potential tropical cyclone number two is evolving as we speak into a tropical depression number two, and eventually we'll have a tropical storm and possibly a hurricane on our hands in the northern part of the Gulf of Mexico. That's a good distance away from us. Down to the south into the Caribbean, nice day in Barbados, scattered showers in Jamaica and also into Trinidad and Tobago. So the Gateway forecast features some thunderstorms into Toronto. Toronto, parts of Ontario, Quebec, scattered severe thunderstorms possible on Thursday. The same could be said into Thursday evening in New York City. Boston will wait until Thursday night into early Friday for the rain. Atlanta and Miami scattered thunderstorms. And in London, England, it's a warm day, upper 70s with scattered thunderstorms. Our extended forecast brings in that less humid air for a day or two. Then the humidity sneaks back up on us. Overnight lows gain a couple of degrees. We'll be in the mid-80s, 86 Monday. Best chance for rain returns to the forecast on Tuesday with showers and possibly a thunderstorm. AccuWeather was presented by BFNM Insurance Group. I was diagnosed with uh, illness, very frightening, because my son had just turned one, and it was a cancer. So I'm young, new baby, and I needed to get the care that I knew would be definitive so that I wanted to be around for him for a very long time. I got in contact with BFNM and BFNM was able to commit at that time to doing at least 50% so we were comfortable, okay, well we're going to go. Uh, we got off the plane actually the day of the procedure and on my way to the limo, my case manager called and she says, Kiana, 
we got it. You're covered at 100%. And I cried all the way to the office because I was just so happy. The BFNM difference is that I really felt that the case manager really was concerned about my overall care. And because of that, I really appreciated them. I think that personal care, that willingness to listen, and then to work until they were able to get it so that I could get full coverage really made the difference for me. Thanks for staying with us. A man has lost his appeal against a conviction for smuggling cannabis resin into the Westgate prison. A court sentenced Art Simons to a year in prison plus 12 months for committing the January 2015 offense in an increased penalty zone. Elsewhere, in a separate case, Kadeem Abraham rather was sentenced to nine months in prison for smuggling a cell phone into the prison. A court heard he was caught with the prohibited device hidden in his pocket, which it later turned out was destined for another inmate. Switching gears in the wine world, South Africa is still a mere baby, not because the industry is new. Wine is traced back to the 1600s, but because the industry wasn't liberated until the end of apartheid in 1994. With democracy came a worldwide export market. In the 25 years since, South Africa's wine industry has grown to a $2 billion a year market, employing 300,000 people. But as Tony Waterman explains, that industry is now under threat as water becomes a scarce resource. Cape Town, South Africa. Home to Table Mountain, Boulders Beach, shark diving, and 45 minutes outside the city, wine country. It's arguably the most spectacular wine country in the world. But last year, headlines like these were enough to kill anyone's buzz. Cape Town, South Africa could become the world's first major city to run out of water. Day zero, the day in which the taps would run dry, was set for April 12, 2018. It came and went, partially because water conservation efforts dropped consumption from 1.2 billion liters a day to just over 500 million. And while strains have eased in the year since, South Africa is still waging a water war. Three years of unprecedented drought and rising temperatures have taken a toll on the wine industry. The grape harvest for 2019 hit a record low. I think it's opened our eyes to how much water we probably wasted, um, basically with an idea of uh, that it could never run out. Mark LaRue was the head winemaker at Waterford Estate in Stellenbosch, South Africa. The small, family-owned producer focuses on red wine some of which are now sold in Bermuda, including at Marcus's, where this interview took place. About eight years ago, the vineyard started studying their irrigation system to better time when and how much to water. LaRue says it led to less usage, so when the drought hit, Waterford's vines were already acclimated. But manipulation only gets you so far. So as temperatures rise and water remains scarce, Waterford has been eyeing different varietals. It's pointless planting varietals which are suited to cool climate if that's not where we're heading. So uh, I think varietals like Grenache Noir is really taking um, a big drive in South Africa. It's a varietal that does not like water and can actually produce great wines with lower alcohols in, in, in hotter climates. Warmer temperatures can diminish a wine's taste, characteristics, and increase alcohol levels. Perhaps more concerning are erratic and extreme weather events. In February, unusually heavy rainfall caused severe flooding in California's Sonoma wine region. And last year, a severe hailstorm damaged thousands of acres of vineyards in Bordeaux, France. If the pattern persists, centuries-old wine regions could be snuffed out, along with the jobs the industry creates. A lot of South Africa's vineyards are still hand-harvested, manually worked, so, so it is an important region um, or, or industry to, to supply uh, jobs. And so if, if vineyards are not making it, if we're not adapting, we do lose a lot of jobs from that point of view. An ominous situation, not just for the wine industry, but for industry as a whole. Thanks, Tony. And still to come, Earl Basted will have all the latest sports news in just a few minutes.
Sears is Bermuda's largest home appliance store with over 200 appliances in our showroom. We have refrigerators and freezers, gas ovens and electric ranges, washers and dryers. Sears has a wide selection of craftsmen's tools and accessories. Beautify your home with our lawn and garden tools. We have everything you need for outdoor entertaining. Located at 41 Victoria Street, Sears is open Monday through Saturday from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. Sears, reliable delivery, quality service, and everyday low prices. Are you required to take one or more medications daily but have a hard time remembering when to take them? The Phoenix Stewards can help with an MDS blister pack, a multi-dose packaging system that makes it easier to manage and take your medication. Each MDS blister pack contains medication for the week and is pre-packed, sealed, and labeled by a pharmacist. Prescriptions grouped by the day and the time of day you should take them. Take confidence in knowing you're using your medications as the doctor planned. Visit the Phoenix Stewards to get your MDS blister pack today. The Phoenix Stewards, for a better life. Turning to sports, Earl Baisden brings us the very latest from the sports desk. In keeping with his promise, businessman Zane DeZilva presented a check in the sum of $50,000 to the Bermuda Football Association and members of the Bermuda national team that finished 11th overall in the recently concluded CONCACAF Gold Cup tournament that saw Mexico defeat USA in the final. As you know, um, I made a commitment when I was overseas with the team uh, to make a donation to the players and the staff uh, in a total amount of $50,000, which they will split uh, between them. Uh, this $50,000 is to show appreciation not only from myself and my family, but also my extended island construction family. Uh, whom we have a lot of history with football. Um, I have a bit of history myself, as you, you, some of you may know. Um, but the main purpose for the donation is to show our, our, um, our great satisfaction with the effort that you guys put in. Um, I think that uh, the effort that you have shown certainly gave me a buzz. I think it gave Bermuda a buzz. I think it gave all the spectators that were in the stadiums a buzz. And uh, my hope is that it inspires uh, the players and the staff and also our players that are up and coming. Bermuda played their second ICC Under-19 World Cup qualifier, America's regional match, taking on the United States of America in King City, Canada yesterday. Bermuda will build up for 71 with Shirai Pankton, the top scorer on 21. In reply, United States of America scored 72 for 1. Nairobi Smith Mills was the only Bermuda builder to team a wicket, finishing with figures of 4.3 overs, 1 for 35. Bowling kept he had another medal at the NetWest Island Games going on in Gibraltar. Gloria Dill and David Maycock won the mixed doubles silver medal when they recorded a combined 2,044 pins. Maycock bowled five 200 plus games while Dill was consistent. Damian Matthews and Erlene Tucker finished fifth with 1,999 pins. Lamar Richardson and Florence Simons finished ninth with 1,894 pins, while Blake Rayner and Jennifer Stubble finished 12th with 1,747 pins. In tennis over in Gibraltar, Gavin Manders defeated his opponent in straight sets to advance to the round of 16, while Sam Butler defeated his opponent from Jersey in straight sets 6-3, 6-2. Deanna Mendez competed in the women's 1500 meter race, and after a battle for the bronze medal, she would finish fifth by the time of 4:59:55. In men's playoff squash action, Anthony Fellows went down 8-11, 7-11, 11-9, 11-7, 14-12. His opponent from Shetland Island, Stephen Smith, defeated his opponent also from Shetland Island, 9-11, 11-9, 11-3, 11-8. Greg Fitzgerald defeated his opponent from the Falkland Islands, 11-9, 13-11. 11-9. On the women's side in the playoffs, Rachel Barnes went down in her match against her opponent from Cayman Islands, 9-11, 11-5, 11-7, 11-6. Judith Furtado defeated her opponent, 11-3, 11-3, 11-7. A total of 257 young sailors from 65 participating nations, including Bermuda, continue competing in the 2019 Optimus World Championships going on in Antigua. Sebastian Kem continues to lead the Bermuda fleet. He moved up nine places to come off the water in ninth place with 23 net points. This after finishing sixth in the first race of the day in the Blue Fleet and the third of the series, then he crossed the line first in the second race of the day. Christian Eben is holding down the 18th spot after starting the day in 44th with 36 points. 
he would finish sixth in the first race in the Green Fleet and then he finished third in the second race. Magnus Ringstead started the day at 60th but came off the water in 86th place with 95 points. Laura Hopman is in 101st place with 109 points and Nicole Stubble is in 178th place with 166 points. Daniel Phillips began competing on the European Junior Tennis Tour as he took to the courts for the VLTC Euro Under-14 tournament going on in Malta. Phillips took to the court in his opening round match against his opponent from Russia and advanced in straight sets 6-3-6-2. Phillips then took to the court against an opponent from Slovakia and defeated him in straight sets 6-1-6-3. Phillips continued his winning days but needed three sets to do so, defeating his opponent from Serbia 6-love 1-6-6-2. In his final match of the day, Phillips teamed up with Yui Dell from Belgium in the doubles, and they defeated their opponents from Cyprus in straight sets 7 6, 6 4. Meanwhile, Tariq Simons was back in action on the ITF Junior Tennis Tour, competing in the ITF Jamaica Junior International Tennis Tournament in Kingston, Jamaica. Simons took to the court to take on number three seed Benjamin Kite from the United States of America in his opening round match. However, Simons would fall in straight sets 6 1, 6 4. Nicholas Narraway began competing in the Junior Tour of Ireland cycling event with his USA East ID talent team. American rider Eli Hust took the opening stage of the Junior Tour of Ireland with his visiting Hot Dudes team crossing the line in time of 101.54. Narraway crossed the line 61st overall with a large group of riders clocking a time of 102.01. I'm Earl based in with Bermuda Broadcasting Sports. Save $2 on tree-ripe, juicy peaches and nectarines, $2.99 per pound. Family pack, fresh ground hamburger, only $2.99 per pound. Save $1.10 on ShopRite Sharp Shredded Cheese, $2.99 for an 8-ounce package. Package of fours, double rolls, Charmin Ultra Soft or Strong Toilet Tissue, $4.99. Match like charcoal briquettes, $8.99 for a 3.1-pound bag. All stores open Monday through Saturday until 10 p.m. and Sunday 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. for your shopping convenience. My name is Donna De Silva, and I'm your parish constable. I'm excited to work with you so we can make Sandy's a safer place in Bermuda. Good day, everyone. My name is Sarifa Bridgman. I will be your parish constable for Southampton. Looking forward to engaging with you. Good day, Bermuda. I am the appointed parish constable for Warwick. I look forward to serving my community as well as meeting with all of you. My name is Roseanne Miser, better known as PC Buffy. I'm looking forward to working in the parish of Pedgick, where I was born and raised. Good day, Bermuda. To my Pembroke people, my name is Anthony Bartley, and I'll be your parish constable. I look forward to meeting you and getting to know everyone. Hey Bermuda, I'm Constable 991 Arthur Deal. I'm going to be responsible for the Pembroke area. I'm looking forward to achieving great heights with you, the community, and myself. Good day, all. My name is Kyle Otterbridge, Police Constable 2420. I'll be a parish constable for Devonshire Parish. Looking forward to building future partnerships with the community. Thank you. Hi, I'm Constable Terrellian Painter. I will be your parish constable for Smith's Parish. Looking forward to working with all of them. Hi, I'm Constable Latanya Smith, and I will be your Hamilton Parish Officer. It takes a village, and I look forward to being part of yours. And that's our program for this evening. I'm Jasmine Patterson. Thanks for watching. Good night.
Jasmine Patterson's wardrobe and makeup is provided by Gibbons Company.